saw some of you probably posting on your Instagram stories, so you know I felt like doing it too. Um, I have a question for you. Have you ever wondered though why a feature like stories exists on a social networking application like Instagram? More than that, have you ever thought about how it was built the way it was built? To function that the way it functions, to look that the way it looks. Once it was built, how was it exposed to all the millions and millions of users that Instagram has? Let me pose another question here. Have you ever thought about who in an organization decides or answers these questions? Is it the engineering team? Is it the marketing team? The business development team? The design team? Well, the answer is yes. Hopefully, it's a collaborative decision between all of these functions. But is there one role that is primarily accountable for de determining the success of a product? And in recent times, especially in technology companies, the answer is yes. And that role is called a product manager within the discipline of product management. Unfortunately, not a lot of people know about this role. And there's also a scarcity of formal education and resources within this discipline. You know, a few years ago, I went back to university to do my master's uh, in technology management. And I was very excited because this was a unique degree that aligned with product management. And I was really hoping to learn a lot about business technology. I remember during our orientation week, um, I was introducing myself. Uh, I was talking about product management. And one of the professors very enthusiastically came up to me and said, hey, you know, I too was a project manager. And uh, one person laughed. I, <laughs> I promise you in a room full of product managers that joke would have really landed. Um, if you want to annoy product managers, just call them project managers, right? So in many ways though, that sentence is quite representative of how people think about this profession. So what I did was I tried to evaluate if there were other students who felt the same way, who wanted more resources within this discipline, and I, had a, I got an overwhelmingly positive response. So I started University of Illinois' first student organization on product management, which uh, at the time was a handful of its kind within the entire country too. You know, the goal there was to equip talented students uh, with the right skills and attributes to be successful product creators and managers. Something that I intend to do today, and uh, I think 10 minutes is enough time to do that, right? Um, so let's, let's try. The way I want to approach this is I want to talk about a little bit about the chronology uh, and the evolution of this discipline. Uh, and then we can naturally get into what this role encapsulates. Uh, and then, you know, I want to talk about my own perspective of what lies within the core of this uh, principle of product management, what unites different types of product managers uh, in order to have a crucial and pivotal impact on the success of a product delivery. So let's start by looking at the history a little bit. You know, traditionally technology firms have operated in a way where you know, they create novel technology and then they find a problem to solve in the market. If you look at Texas Instruments, a very successful company, TI, in the early 80s had launched this 16-bit microprocessor, which was far superior to the existing 8-bit microprocessor that they had. Uh, there was no market need for something like this, you know? However, when they didn't get the response that they saw in the market, instead of listening to, listening to market signals, they actually doubled down and used this expensive piece of hardware to launch a home computer in the 80s, which clearly you know, had no utility in the market at that time. Now, there were several reasons why that home computer failed. Uh, one of them definitely is this approach of really pushing a solution when a problem doesn't exist, right? And clearly, TI is not going to hire me anytime soon, so let's carry on with that. Um, so there emerged this need, really, of 
finding a role of someone who can be customer centric and put customers first, find the problems in the market and then devise solutions specifically to address those problems. The next thing is about product development life cycles. Traditionally, product development life cycles were very long. You know, sales and marketing would sign contracts and dump the work essentially on engineering. And engineering would take 12, 15, 18 months, you know, in a uniquely op opaque silo and build something which then they would expose to the customer. And many times it would just be vastly different, right? So what this meant was major overhauls, major revamps, which would require a lot more time, but also a lot more investment. So there emerged this need of a more iterative and agile way of product development that uh, regularly sought feedback and was not afraid of modifications and scope changes, with which emerged the need of a role of someone who could pick right execution frameworks uh, to guarantee the success of product delivery. Lastly, I want to talk about the silos that were created traditionally. We used to have marketing teams working individually without interacting with engineering teams. Marketing folks couldn't speak the language of, engineering, of engineers. Engineers had no pension to speaking the language of marketing, to be honest. So again, there emerged a need of someone who can talk cross-functionally, who can speak the language of marketing and engineering. So with this, you know, all of this really builds up to the creation of a cross-functional role that can be accountable for the overall success of the product. Someone who can analyze markets, can qualify and quantify opportunities, can really empathize with customers, understand their problems and device solutions, work with engineering teams, to build and manage that solution and then take it to the market. And in many ways, this really encapsulates what this role does, the role of a product manager. Yet, there is a lot of confusion, right? And that exists because within organizations based on their scale and their growth, product managers are really asked to do different subsets of what I just talked about. Some are more focused on tech, some are more focused on marketing, some are more focused on growth. So to me, the way I see this and what I feel at the very core level unites different product managers or different entities who want to play this role uh, to positively impact a successful product delivery comes down to three things, which is at a very simple and core level. One, being a problem identifier. Two, being a problem solver and three being a value generator. So we'll delve a little bit deeper into all three of these through the lens of my own professional experience. Uh, and let me set some context before that, right? I, I work at Infinix Healthcare, which uh, is a healthcare technology company in the US market. The US healthcare system, uh, within that ecosystem, the insurance companies play a major role, right? From hospital systems and healthcare systems, insurance carriers or companies are a major source of their revenue because when they provide a service to their patients, a large chunk of that is, or the price of that is reimbursed from the insurance companies. Insurance companies, on the other hand, do not want to be overbilled or overcharged, right? So they have this program called prior authorization where they want to essentially do clinical checks uh, on every case where a physician wants to recommend an expensive procedure to a patient, for example. Uh, insurance companies want to validate that there is in fact clinical need for that. So say I have uh, a thumb injury and my physician wants me to get an MRI. So they actually have to send this long request to the insurance company where they provide all my case details, clinical notes, uh, to prove that an MRI in fact is required and that you know, a more or less expensive x-ray would not suffice. This whole process of requesting a prior authorization involves expensive resources from 
uh, healthcare systems like nurses taking time away from crucial patient care and just devoting to this administrative process that can be very lengthy and uh, arduous, to be honest. So we looked at this whole process and we s thought that what if we could give them some of this time back? Uh, could it positively impact patient care, right? So we found a problem worth solving. Let's talk about value. Right? And when we talk about value, value isn't just uh, from the frame of a customer, right? Value has to be preserved and generated for your organization as well. Let's talk about the customer first though. So within this case, from a customer point of view, how can we generate value for them? We can generate value for them if we make this whole process less intensive, which is make it more cost effective. Uh, we can make it shorter, we can give them more time back. And we can make sure that these prior authorizations are obtained more reliably so that patients can come in and get the care that they need to get. The second part from an organization point of view is how do we do this in a way that's profitable for the organization as well. Right? So we have to develop whatever solution that we do develop uh, in a cost-effective way, and it has to be easily replicable to other users within the market so that we can scale seamlessly. So that is the concept of value. Let's talk about the solution now. The thing about solutions is solution has to consider both of the first two things. Right? There has to be a problem worth solving, and then the solution has to maximize the value in every facet of these things. So the other thing about solutions is that customers always like to be the experts on solutions, but you have to treat customers as the experts on the problem, not the solution. Right? When we tried to look at this space, we saw a lot of competitors doing what customers were asking, which is devise a simple automated solution that could automate requesting prior authorizations to insurance companies. And uh, a lot of those competitors failed doing that because of several reasons, uh, primarily lack of electronic infrastructure uh, by the insurance companies and just the complexity of the clinical nature of some of these tasks. So we tried a different approach here, an approach of really augmented intelligence, really pioneering augmented intelligence within the space, where we use traditional forms of automation that other competitors were using, uh, along with some very unique uh, predictive insights uh, using machine learning. And we augmented that by human and clinical specialists. That could come in any time technology failed, right? So we can use them as a crutch, essentially. And uh, what this approach really allowed us to do was comprehensively maximize value of being cost effective, doing the task more reliably, and providing time back to our customers. Now, to conclude, you know, let's take a step back and let's look at product management. When you familiarize yourself a little bit more within this discipline, you'll hear a lot of things about product managers. You'll hear them being called a mini CEO of a product, you hear them being called the voice of the customer, uh, or as my engin engineer friends say, the, the good for nothings in a company. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I feel like there's a little bit of truth in all of these three things. But you know, if I have to leave you with something, I'll say whether as a product manager or as another role where you want to positively impact the success of your product or your feature, just be a good problem identifier, a problem solver, and a value generator, and you'll be just fine. Thank you, everyone.